Have you ever been baking a cake and thought, I wonder if I could use these ingredients to clean my house? Okay, maybe just me. But yes, you can use one particular ingredient in cake making to do a lot of other really cool stuff. Now, I wouldn't suggest washing your clothes with eggs or scrubbing your floors with flour, but baking soda will do a great job at both of those things. You can even brush your teeth with the stuff or use it to wash your hair like I did. That was a very short-lived natural shampoo phase in college. Okay, never mind. The same is true with magnetics. Inductors first come to mind, right? And for most of us, our only experience with magnetics has been limited to the world of inductors. But magnetics can actually be used in a bunch of other really cool ways. And I would not include brushing your teeth or washing your hair in that list. Definitely a bad idea. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Magnetics aren't just for inductors anymore, my friends. And today I've got an expert in the field of magnetics, Wilmer Campioni from Kemet, here to help us learn how to use magnetics in our next design. Let's go. And before we get started, throughout this broadcast, there will be various links that you can click for more information about this topic. Hi, Wilmer. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. It's great to be here. Okay, so when it comes to inductors, magnetics are usually the primary topics of conversation. But there's other cool stuff that you can do with magnetics, right? Yeah, that's right. So as you mentioned, magnetics, they're not really just for inductors anymore. There's lots of different stuff you can do with them. If you take a quick look at our parts page here on Mauser.com, we have several different things and some of which are more than just what are the expected capacitors from Kemet. Some of them are temperature sensors, flex suppressors, zero phase current transformers, and what we call our TPI inductors. And we'll go into the physics and applications for each of these. Okay, great. Let's start with the thermal sensors. All right, so thermal sensors. Let's talk about the Curie temperature. If you have a magnetic material, all of the magnetic domains are lined up in the same direction. That's what gives it its magnetic properties. As the Curie point is approached, those domains start to destabilize a little bit. And then once you get past that Curie point, then the alignment appears to be random and the material is no longer magnetic. We've developed a material called Thermorite where that Curie point can be very tightly controlled. Okay, so what exactly can we do with that? And why does it matter that we can control the Curie point? So with that, we can make what are called thermal sensor reed switches. So a reed switch is a device that has two conductors lined up in parallel with one another, and there's a slight overlap. Now, in the case of our thermal sensors, those conductors are actually magnets. When you are below the Curie point, those magnets come into contact with one another and current can flow from one direction to the other. When you go past the Curie point, those magnets separate and that causes the current to stop flowing. And then once you come back down below the Curie point, those conductors, those magnets come back into contact with one another and current can start flowing again. So imagine you have some sort of power source that is powering some type of heating element. And then in series with that, you have a thermal sensor. That thermal sensor will then allow current to pass from the power source to the heating element until the Curie point is reached. Once that Curie point is reached, then current flow will stop going from the power source to the heating element and the device overall will cool off. Then once it has cooled off enough, the current will start to flow again and heating will continue. Now there is a little bit of a hysteresis of a differential temperature from off to on, but it's only about a couple of degrees. Our thermal sensors come in both normally off 
and normally on positions. The important thing to note here is that there's no logic necessary. There's no feedback, no microcontroller, and no software development required in order to sense temperature as you would do with something like a thermistor. Now, I hear that magnetic devices are often used in EMC. Is that also the case with some of your devices? Yeah, that's right. We also have a device that we call a flex suppressor. So let me go into some background on permeability. If you look at permeability, it's actually a complex quantity that has a real and an imaginary component. We'll call the real component of this complex permeability mu prime. Mu prime corresponds to the inductance of the material. Now, that inductance gives you the ability to reshape and reform magnetic fields. Then you also have mu double prime. In the case of mu double prime, that is the imaginary component, and that component is the magnetic impedance or the loss or the attenuation of the material. So our flex suppressors are flexible sheets of polymer material that have highly compact metal flakes suspended in that material. So what that does is any incident incoming wave within a certain bandwidth, of course, will be absorbed by the flex suppressor material and converted to a small amount of heat. So Wilmer, what are some of the challenges or design considerations here? So one of the th important things to note when it comes to flex suppressors is that the direction matters. So an incoming field that goes parallel to the flex suppressor material has actually much less permeability than a field going parallel. So that so-called anisotropic permeability is the result of the fact that the permeability when the field is parallel is greater than the permeability when the field is perpendicular. Okay, cool. So how do I use these things? Okay, yeah. So imagine you have a circuit board with a device that is radiating EMI and there's other devices nearby that are sensitive to EMI. So that EMI aggressor will radiate some noise and it will reflect off of the internal enclosure and affect the device that's sensitive to EMI. But if you place the flex suppressor material on the inside of the enclosure, a lot of that radiated EMI will be absorbed by the flex suppressor material and no longer have a significant impact on the device that is sensitive to EMI. Another thing that you can do with the flex suppressor material is in the application of wireless charging or NFC. In both of those cases, you have transmit and receive coils that radiate out in all directions. But if you place the flex suppressor material behind those transmit and receive coils, then you can gather up some of that extra unused flux and that will have an impact on your efficiency in that it'll improve the efficiency because you're gathering up and using more of that available flux. You mentioned current sensors. Can you tell me some about those? Yeah, so we have what are called zero phase current transformers. So before I get into those, let's talk about traditional transformers. In a traditional transformer, when you energize the primary winding, that will create a magnetic field. That magnetic field can be picked up by the secondary winding and that will induce a voltage in the secondary winding by way of the law of electromagnetic induction. The purpose of the core is to gather that flux from the primary side and shuffle it over and shuttle it over to the secondary side so that that flux can be used to generate voltage on the secondary winding. In the case of a current sensor, a similar thing is happening. So imagine you have a wire that's carrying AC current and you feed that through the bore, through the core of a toroidal current sensor. That input current will generate an electromagnetic field. That electromagnetic field will be picked up by the windings of the current sensor and it will generate a voltage. So one of the things you can do with that is in the case of a zero phase current transformer, if you put in both the input path and the return path of your conductors, then as long as the phases of those two are matched well, then there will be no voltage generated on the output. Now, if there's some sort of mismatch in phase between the two, then you have a non-zero situation 
and that is an indicator that there is some sort of ground fault in your circuit. And then you can take further action from there to either shut off the device or generate some sort of warning signal or something that there is an unsafe condition in this circuit. Now, we just spent some time talking about non-inductor use of magnetics, but can we also talk about some cool inductor stuff a bit too? All right, fine. Yeah. Inductors, of course, that's the primary purpose of magnetic devices. So let's talk about that a little bit. So going back to what traditional inductors look like, they're essentially just a coil of wire wrapped around some type of core material. Now, the purpose of that inductor is to store electrical energy in the inductor in the form of magnetic energy. The amount of inductance depends a great deal on the core material of the device. So whether it's some type of air core, a ferrite core, or metal composite, that has an impact on the inductance. Okay, so the core material changes the inductance. But I've also heard the amount of turns also has a big impact. Yeah, that's right. The amount of turns also has a big impact on the inductance. If you look at our inductance equation here, mu sub r is the relative permeability of the core material, but also in the numerator you have n squared. That's the number of turns of the material. So n squared, the number of turns, has a big impact on the overall inductance. But we have an inductor with a single turn. And the reason we're able to get away with that is that we have core material that is a very high permeability. So we can use only a single turn of wire and still get back a lot of that would be lost inductance because of the high permeability of our core material. So to put it into perspective, a one centimeter long, one millimeter diameter wire has inductance of about six nanohenries. Our devices range from 150 nanohenries to about 230 nanohenries, and they're capable of carrying from 64 amps up to 93 amps. And one of the ways that we control the amount of inductance of these devices is that if you look at the construction of this device, it's a conductor material sandwiched in between two pieces of core material. The amount of air gap in between those two pieces of core material will have an impact on the amount of inductance of the device. So we can very tightly control that air gap and that gives us control over the inductance. Okay, cool. So what can I do with this thing? All right, so these TPI inductors have very low loss, have high saturation current and again, are able to carry a high amount of current. So that means that they can be used in devices with high switching frequencies, as I mentioned, high current devices, and also devices that have very fast transients. So on the left-hand side here, I have a power distribution circuit, low voltage. However, some of these, particularly in server or PC or network applications, are low voltage, but very high frequency, high current, high switching transients. So these TPI inductors are very well suited for these types of applications in DC to DC converters. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Wilmer. All right, thanks. I'll talk magnetics with you anytime. And before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you can find more information about why magnetics aren't just for inductors anymore. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal.